Welcome everybody to one more Authors at Google talk. Today with us are science fiction authors Larry Neven and Gregory Benford. They have been here about a year ago when they uh, presented, uh, almost two, when they presented the Bowl of Heaven. And today uh, they will talk about the sequel to the Bowl of Heaven, Ship Star. Uh, I will try to make this introduction short, but you know, like it's hard to make introductions short when you have such amazing people next to you. I mean, you need younger writers for that. <laughs> I need younger writers, yes. So a little bit about Larry Neven. Uh, he was born in 1938 in Los Angeles, California. Won his first Hugo Award for the best short story for the Neutron Star in 1967. And he won it uh, in 1972 for In Constant Moon, and in 1975 for The Whole Man. In 1976, he won the Hugo Award for the best novelette, The Borderland of Soul. He won the Nebula Award in 1970, and the Hugo and Locus Awards in 1971 for Ringworld, where he is famous, I guess. Neven has written scripts for three science fiction television series, and a logical fantasy series. He's also, also the author of Neven's Laws for Writers. And we may get back to them uh, later during the talk. Larry Neven attended uh, Washburn University in Topeka, California Institute of Technology, and UCLA. He holds degrees in mathematics and psychology. Much of Larry's writing since the 1970s has been in collaboration, particularly with Jerry Purnell, Stephen Barnes, Brenda Cooper, Edward M. Lerner, and of course, our second guest, Gregory Benford. Gregory Benford was born in 1941 in Mobile, Alabama. Mobile. Mobile. <laughs> Mobile, Alabama. It, it's not mobile, it stays there. It stays there. <laughs> In 1969, he began writing a regular science column for the magazine Amazing Stories. Gosh. His time travel novel, Timescape, won both the Nebula Award and the John W. Campbell Memorial Award. Gregory has been nominated for four Hugo Awards and 12 Nebula Awards. In addition to Timescape, he and Gordon Eklund won the Nebula for the novelette If the Stars Are Gods. Gregory has created and written about the first computer virus in the late 60s. We can come back to this. This is the right environment, I guess. Yes. <laughs> His work in physics at the University of California, Irvine, has focused on theoretical and experimental plasma physics, including studies of extremely strong turbulence uh, in astrophysical contexts, and studies of magnetic structures from the galactic center to large-scale galactic jets. If you have read The Bowl of Heaven, you may piece these two pieces of information together. Yes. He made contribution in understanding and addressing global warming and related chemical changes in ocean water. Gregory also serves on the board of directors and the steering committee of the Mars Society, which is dear to my heart. And Gregory has received a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of Oklahoma in Norman, followed by a Master of Science and Doctorate from the University of California, San Diego. That was the shortest I could do it. And my apologies for all the things that I missed in this introduction, but I think it would take half an hour to get them properly introduced. Please give a warm, warm welcome to you. So next slide. Let me <laughs> let me just start with uh, ship star. Yeah. And to tell you how much disappointed I was when I read the Ball of Heaven. <laughs> yeah. And the reason I was disappointed is that I did not realize that it will have a sequel. I devoured oh. the book in a couple of weeks, and I get to the end and it says to be continued. Yeah. I didn't like you guys at that moment, <laughs> but I love the fact that uh, we have Shipstar now. So, do you want to 
start us off by? Uh, let, let me apologize to him and, and about half of you, uh, because I'm, I made every effort to find an ending, ending for, the, for the bowl of heaven, uh, knowing that it was the middle of a two-part novel. We always planned it to be a two-part novel, but I thought I could find a break point. Uh, all, all we really did was, uh, was give our characters a chance to sit down and rest for a while. Yeah, yeah which they needed at that point, and so did we. Uh, we. We started this project thinking we could do it in one volume, and then it became impossible because we don't like doorstop novels. It became uh, impossible <laughs> because he kept finding new, in, new implications. Oh, yeah, it's always <laughs> me, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, we just, yeah, you know, it's a big idea. In fact, we're, we're already getting pressure from people saying, hey, you've got to go further and tie up this thing and, and that thing and so forth. And we might do it in an anthology or something like that. I'm not sure. Uh, but it, it's a big object. And how many Ringworld novels are there now? Five, isn't it? No, it's four. Four. Uh, unless like you count five. Protector. In well, which I do. The Ringworld did not appear. <laughs> True. Uh, so this is the way you do things. When you're trying to figure out a big object, as you saw from the previous, our previous appearance here, we, we went out and even commissioned art so we could see what the thing looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll review some of that in, this, in these slides here and then show you some new stuff. Is we developed for the book, the second book, for Shipstar. So it's uh, Having finished a book, you keep on thinking about it. Yeah. It's always true. Right. I mean, you can see why Shakespeare killed everybody at the end of a Hamlet, because, <laughs> you know, at least there's no sequel, right? <laughs> it was already long. See, this, is, this will be a quick review. This is Ring World, ancient history now, uh, uh, and next. And then this is, what is this? Oh, yeah, that's the, uh, right, that's We're gonna to have get to the scale. We're going to peering I mean, over our shoulder, aren't we? Right. I mean, the, the scale is solar system, in, and so it's this, and we got, of course, all the original thinking about this was done by Freeman Dyson, about Dyson spheres, and there's a, a, a program at Lick Observatory to, to look for Dyson spheres right now, and the WISE experiment is still being mined, that was an a infrared scope uh, at the L2 point. Uh, which was, uh, which is still being mined to look for Dyson spheres, which are tiny, fairly faint infrared sources where uh, there's no star. <laughs> um, but it it's wouldn't not be dust. that faint, though, would they? They're still put. It's, it's still the output of a star. Yeah. It's just being reduced down to the temperature of warm water. Yeah. Right. Next. Let's see what is next. And so these ideas about building up structures, this, this is one that came around in the 1970s, is that you, how would you build a Dyson sphere? You, you build it out of these belts, which begin to look suspiciously like ring worlds. <laughs> Next. And then you go on to uh, other formations like this. This is not particularly stable, but uh, remember, this is on a scale of a solar system. And then next. Ah, oh, there it is. Here we are. Oh, this is about the Lick Observatory program, which Jeff Marcy is running right now, to look for Dyson spheres. Uh, next, and this is kind of the general philosophy of the subject. Um, you see, there's a term in the genre, big, dumb, big, dumb objects. And so when I began thinking about this and talked to Larry about it, I always objected to the dumb part, you know, because uh, the ring world is actually not passively stable. You have to readjust for every time somebody slams their foot down in the ring world, it's inherently unstable. Uh, it will slide sideways right into the star. So you have to have corrector jets the whole time. So it's really not that dumb an object. Uh, next. It started dumb. It started and, dumb. And dumb, uh, the big dumb object is, is far easier to write about if you're a storyteller. It's uh, probably self-assembled as well, right? The, the thing isn't doing anything. It's, 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 it's there to be explored. All your, all your action comes from the characters in a big dumb object story. Yeah. There are no maintenance chapters <laughs> in a big dumb object novel. <laughs> Next, so the, this this is a view of, of the old uh, ideas. This is from uh, uh, this this is from the U, the, the O'Neill colony era in the 1970s, where suddenly it looked like you want to live in space in in a stressed object, 
which is spinning at the same time. That's the point. Everything we're going to talk about is, is under very, very high tensile stress uh, because it's like an inverted swimming pool, right? <laughs> uh, next. And so uh, R.C. Clark did this in Rendezvous with Rama, very big long cylinder and enters the solar system. What's it doing here? It's only just cruising by and make, doing a delta V. It's on its way out already. Next. Um, and so we devised this guy. This is the size of a solar system, and that little bright object in there is its star. And the jet is propelling the bowl of heaven forward. So this is a habitat that's moving through the galaxy. So you get to stay at home and go for, for a, a nice long journey on cruise control, more or less, except it's inherently unstable, right? I mean, if you turn the jet off, the shell, the bowl, falls into the star. Mm -hmm. Big problem. But of course, walking around on two legs is unstable, too. <laughs> it requires command and control system, which most animals don't have. I mean, part of the whole thing about human intelligence is that we, we're on we're on an already unstable platform. It's not like you're a smart animal with four legs. You got only two. So, so smart creatures will make unstable structures. That's a kind of a lesson. Next. And this is a, how it looks from the side. The discovery moment is when, they, when a starship hauls just above this and it can look back and see that it's a bowl and a star. Because from behind, unless you notice the jet, you can't even see the star. So it's a big sudden revelation when you overhaul it. And that's the opening of Bowl of Heaven. Next. Um, and this is the star, a very troubled star, uh, which produces the jet, which is on the other side. Uh, and the entire star is man magnetically manipulated to make the jet, because it's not a naturally occurring object. Next. Um, yeah. And this is so it's only part of the diagram, but it shows you that the object is spinning to give centrifugal gravity, and it depends on where you are in the bowl. I'll show you the acceleration plots a little later. The point is, they're up, you're up near the axis. There's no gravity. There's no centrifugal gravity to match anything. Down here on the, the great plane, uh, you get about, what is it, 0.8 Earth's gravity. So it's not exactly ours. It's a little bit lighter. And the beings who live there are bigger as you would expect. Uh, turns out the first ones you meet are giant birds, uh, smart birds. Um, so the, all this goes into the design. Next, let's see. So this is the view from the Great Plain, looking at the star. By the way, the star is moved into the field of group, uh, view. Don Davis had the, the dimensions wrong, but I like this shot because it shows you the star too. But that's actually further to the right. So this is what it looks like if you stand on, on the Great Plain, looking up into the sky. This is a very, very clear day. But on a clear day, you can see across the entire structure. And you're aware of the fact that you live in a non-planetary environment. Next. So this, by the way, is the acceleration, as you can read. It's the centrifugal gravity versus angle. And there's no gravity right up when you're close to the axis, which is called, by the way, the knot hole. And that's how we fly into this object. Um, and the gravity is maximum out on the Great Plain. But notice that it's curved, locally curved. And therefore, there's an acceleration of gravity. Next, parallel to the ground also. And as you get near the axis, it's pushing you away. And it was designed that way because they don't want the inhabitants to go near the axis because that's where all the magic occurs. And you have to steer the jet through the knot hole. And that's where the elite lives. It's like Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. You don't want people coming. <laughs> so there's a push against people who are trying to walk their way to the axis, which is, remember, on the scale of 100 billion kilometers away. So. It's going to take a while. So almost all the transport in this thing, as we learned <coughs> in both novels, is by very fast maglev trains. Because they don't have any fossil fuels, <laughs> right? You can't fly around in the air burning high value fossil fuels. So you use trains. But not entirely. Next. This is what it looks like as you're zooming around far above it. There's a by the way, a, a confined atmosphere with a thin monolayer to keep all this stuff in. But on the right, 
there are these enormous storms. There are always storms out on the great seas. But on the left, those are the mirrors that reflect sunlight back to the base of the jet and create the energy for the jet. And then it's magnetically shaped into a jet that blows through the knot hole. So you see, it's <coughs> propelling itself using the energy from the star in more ways than one. It reflects the sunlight back, and then it blows the star blows the plasma off, and that pushes the whole contraption through the galaxy. Uh, next. And this is a view of the clouds as you descend toward the top of the layered atmosphere. And you can see sunlight effects and, and refraction and uh, spectral breakup and so on. It's kind of a pretty view. Of course, this isn't painted. This is actually a view of a cloud on the Earth. I'm giving away a secret here. This is not actually from another planet. It's from this planet. <laughs> Next. Um, and this is how they got in. This is the frontispiece on Bowl of Heaven uh, in full color. Uh, this is how the starship flies into the knot hole against the jet to get into the object. They figure it's the closest, it's the safest approach. Rather than flying up in front of somebody's sky, you come at them from behind. So they loop around the bowl and come up against the jet, swimming upstream. Next. And this is, ah, good. And this is close up of the foreground. Notice that way over on the left, there's some human beings walking around trying to figure out how this thing works. Over here is what is called a zigzag tree, a local common formation of a kind of tree. Yeah. Which we, has, didn't, we didn't describe that. Don Davis, the artist, right. uh, interpreted our, our minor uh, description. Right. Notice that it secures itself against high winds by having roots come out of the limbs. So it's really pinned down and, and therefore lasts longer. Um, and then over here, there's this funny thing, which you'll see up show, close, which is another method of transport on the bowl. Next, it is and this, uh, an enormous living dirigible, <laughs> which makes its own hydrogen, which is, by the way, a convenient weapon. <laughs> um, and it's called a skyfish, unoriginally. Uh, and there's a whole lot of this in both books what it's like to be in the skyfish and to fight a skyfish. We um, do have some neat life forms in these books. Yeah, that was the point. Strange, interesting aliens. So we spent a lot of time just dreaming up new aliens. And Next, social order. And the social order, right. And this is where the skyfish moors itself. Again, this is in the painting. This is actually a, 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 a prominent mountain on the planet. Anybody know what it is? Notice it looks just like it has a base on the, on the top. Kilimanjaro. Yes, you're right. You're cheating. Yes. <laughs> Kilimanjaro. This is how Kilimanjaro actually looks. It's an extinct volcano in the middle of Africa, very close to the equator, too. Next. And so this is some comment on these kinds of structures are inherently conservative, right? Because it's too easy to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are lots of rules. You can read this. I won't read it to you. That, that say, you know, don't do any, no sudden movements, basically, is the order. And you have to have a good, clear hierarchy so things don't get out of control, literally. You're living in an inherently unstable system. You see, we live on a, the Earth is actually a big, dumb object. <laughs> Not quite so dumb as we would like to believe. No. <laughs> uh, it, we used to think that continents don't move, for instance. Uh, drifting continents is a, is a newish concept. Yeah. Uh, the more we learn about the Earth, uh, the more we, we become tempted to try to do things about it. Weather control. Uh, yeah, which is certainly coming, or, or climate control, actually. Yeah. Uh, geoengineering, as it's known. Yeah, weather control is probably impossible. Right, right. Or there, there'll be an app for it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Big Next. fast events. Yeah, exactly. Um, smart means vigilant. So as I said here, you know, I used to work on shrimp boats in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm from southern Alabama. And, and a, bowl is the, a, 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 a boat, as my grandfather uh, uh, remarked to me once, is, is, is just looking for a a chance to sink. I mean, something's always going to go wrong. Uh, and, uh, and it does, in, in, particularly in the second novel, Ship Star. Next, 
You wouldn't respect us if things didn't go wrong. Right, yes. <laughs> and it wouldn't be, so this is, this is the thing. Whoops, I mean, I mean if, if you drill through the bowl, in some places it's only a few millimeters thick, then what's on the outside? The high vacuum, and you are spinning with respect to the surroundings at thousands of kilometers a second. <laughs> so it's a great way to launch spacecraft. You can just pitch them off the back porch, so to speak, and, and they have a very high velocity. And that's how you explore planets as you go by there, or solar systems as you come by. You don't want to get too close to the solar system, because this object will disturb the orbits in a close fly, flyby. So you stay well out, and you throw these craft out at tens of uh, tens, uh, or, sorry, thousands of kilometers a second, and they go explore, and they come back. Yeah, yeah that's it. OK, good. Fine, that's the end of the show and tell. Uh, so we end up with, the, the strategy of the books is, we introduce you to this places. The humans in the drama make a number of assumptions. So do the readers. And we deliberately didn't talk about certain aspects of it. So that in the second book, we then pull the rug out from under your assumptions. And what seemed to be true turns out to be not true. And details about how the whole system works reveal who actually manages the place. You know, when you walk into, when you walk into Google, you don't meet Sergey Brin in the, <laughs> when you're signing in. <laughs> well, you don't, when you come onto an object like this, the people who intersect you when you're trying to board, after all, you're boarding a ship, uh, are not the captain <laughs> or even the same species as the captain. So there's a real hierarchy, and, it, and you have to understand it if you're going to live in this society. Remember, guys, this is an old object. We made it uh, 100 million years, years old or something like it. Uh, they've been accepting borders, expecting borders, for nearly that long. Yeah. Uh, they know what to do about visitors, uh, even armed visitors. Yeah. And they have some interesting weapons, too. But you know, on the ground, uh, the weapons are very constrained because you can't make a weapon that's big enough to blow a hole in the structure. <laughs> that's a very bad idea. Yes. It's a very fragile world. Yes. Going back to writing, so Nevan's laws for writers. Larry, how did you come up with these laws? I wrote. Niven's laws, because I had come up, come up with a few what I considered to be basic truths. Uh, they're, they're not all for writers, just a few of them. Uh, never fire a laser at a mirror. <laughs> uh, from the 1964 Democratic Convention in Chicago, I got uh, never, never throw shit at an armed man. <laughs> and never stand next to somebody who is throwing shit at an armed man. Uh, but, well, my, one of my own principles, never let a waiter escape. Uh, your waiter is holding you prisoner, whether he realizes it or not. And he doesn't have to come back. Uh, In the ones for writers, though, you have one that says, it is a sin to waste the reader's time. Yes. Uh, cu cutting your manuscript is, is always a good idea. Uh, you gradually want, ha, ha. Uh, Bob Gleason taught, taught me this, and he taught me and, and Jerry Purnell, uh, too. Uh, we cut the bejesus out of, uh, out of a mote in God's eye, Jerry and I, with, with, with uh, Bob's help. Uh, we come to Lucifer's hammer, and we've turned it in at 250,000 words. Uh, Bob, the editor, looks at this and, and thinks, uh, we can't raise the price high enough. We'll, we won't sell any copies. Uh, we have to split this in two. Uh, everybody looked at, uh, at, at Hammer and found no place for it to split. Yeah. So, uh, so Bob looks at Lucifer's Hammer uh, with intent to cut it. And he couldn't spare a word. We'd already done our cutting, according to, to all of his tenants. 
uh, eventually they they raised the price to something unreasonable, and you guys all paid it. Yeah. <laughs> That, that was when I realized that there should be software called, for example, anti-adjective. You apply, take a given text, it goes through, it takes out all the adjectives. <laughs> right, right. And then the obvious second product is anti-adverb. So I, re I remember a story in which it was, it was a sort of a magical salt shaker. You'd yeah. hold it like that and the adjectives would all go. Right. Uh, you, want it, you want it in a woman's magazine, you hold it like this, and yeah. the adjectives all come back. Right, right. Or if you're a romance no novelist, you just write the bare text, and then adjective adder comes in and makes the right <laughs> selections for you. And adverb adder, same as all that typing and thinking, uh, because it's a romance novel. Uh, what else I mean, did I say about writers? What else did you say about writers? Uh, Writers who write for other writers should write letters. Like <laughs> Never be embarrassed or ashamed about anything you choose to write. Think of this before you send it to market. <laughs> stories to end all stories on a given topic? Don't. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you have nothing to say, say it any way you like. Stylistic innovations, contorted storylines or none, exotic or genderless pronouns, internal inconsistencies, the recipe for preparing your lover as a cannibal banquet, feel free. If that's what you have to say is important and difficult to follow, use the simplest language possible. If the reader doesn't get it then, let it not be your fault. Yeah, that's a very yeah. good rule. And there's another one that, uh, that I kind of feel about, and that is that you um, you should not use unreliable narrators in science fiction because it's already stra straining credulity of most of the public. But if you want to have the point of view character lying to the reader, you're really taking huge risks. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you first time you find out that the narrative voice told you something that it knew was a lie, there's a powerful tendency to throw it against the wall and see if the spine will crack. And if you're strong enough, it will. <laughs> um, and the last rule, everybody talks first draft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what, what you're hearing here, uh, if it gets quoted, it'll embarrass us the rest of our lives. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, life is lived in first draft. Why don't we open it up for some questions from the audience? Uh, basically, so science fiction often revolves, as uh, the books you're just talking about do, um, around introducing new technologies and then seeing how the people and the societies interact with that. Um, something that I think a lot of people at Google might find interesting, but a lot of people don't know about, and if you're comfortable talking about it, uh, is Sigma, um, the group where you guys were sort of proposing interesting ideas and thoughts. This is a bit of a think tank. Can you, are there any interesting stories you can share about that or that you, thoughts you have on that group um, and the things that came out of it? Uh, it's about Sigma, which is a group of SF writers who, uh, who will think for yes. spare change. Uh, and so we get, uh, we advise people like Department of Defense or yeah. Central Yeah, there are science agency. fiction writers who won't work with the government because that's their attitude. Uh, there are, are some who will, and a lot of us have joined Sigma. Uh, Sigma will work with anybody. Uh, Rather, we'll work with the government. They don't work with terrorists. Yes, and we, we named it that because you know in mathematics, sigma is stands for sum. We sum it up, and, and so we people who wanted you to think forward on a scale of say ten years or twenty years, it's what we're used to doing, and bureaucracies largely are not. Uh, and it leads to many interesting interactions. I'll never forget you, you were there, I think, at this at one of the CIA hotels in the DC area, we had a sealed room, uh, electronically isolated, uh, because it was a bunch of classified stuff. And, uh, and the FBI and the CIA were present, and I'd never realized until that moment how much they hated each other. I mean, it was the, the room was alive with tension. Uh, and I'm gl glad nobody could communicate out, because uh, uh, it's a, it was disturbing, really, to see how they contested everything. Uh, that's one of the things they didn't mean to reveal, but we 
picked up on it right away. And I never noticed any of that. Yeah. I got some blind spots. <laughs> yeah. It's, you, you learn some things from this interaction, particularly that the government really does not take long views of some subjects because it's hard to do. You, you know this at Google. You're, you're thinking long on all kinds of axes that other people don't. Uh, and that's why they call in consultants whom they can uh, believe or not. Um, as you're working through this project, do you have any other ideas in the back of your mind that you'd be interested in exploring with future stories? Um, not then. Uh, whatever we had, we used. And it took us... Uh, it took us about three years once we got going, but we had several years ahead of that to play with this, the, the, these notions. Uh, whatever came up, we worked it in. But since we published the books, since, uh, since we, we turned in uh, Shipstar, uh, we've been thinking there are, there are avenues available, and we don't want to write them. We want to persuade other people to write them. Uh, we'd, we'd like to put together an anthology of, uh, of uh, ship star stories, Bowl of Heaven stories. There are a lot of things we left unexplored just because there are so many implications. Uh, for example, who's sending the gravitational waves, which apparently have messages in them, from the target star, which we call glory? Uh, I mean, what's that about? We actually don't deal with that a lot in the book. And so it's an open door. We can, people can walk through it. But there are many other things uh, 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 that are puzzles, like how do all these species interact? There are a lot of in intelligent alien species, and they tend to be specialized in what they do. So how does that society work? Uh, uh, what, are the, uh, what was the basic idea of, of the Bowl of Heaven anyway? Uh, to build an enormous contraption and then sail around the galaxy. It, it's like an enormous cruise ship. But who thinks on a time scale of millions of years? I mean, it, in a way, it's, it's a way of thinking about ourselves, because this is a society, civilization that's 10,000 or so years old. What happens when you, you're millions of years old? What kind of structure does that require in order to not collapse and, and dissolve, as, as so many of our civilizations have? Uh, and so what? What about a galaxy which has been around a long time, 10 billion years, and we're the latest arrivals? You know, uh, most of the stars in the galaxy are older than we are. Uh, what kind of society does it take to last a long time? Because we should think about that because we've got the same problem. As slow as the bowl is, uh, it has not explored very much of the galaxy. Uh, we're likely to find faster, older uh, aliens somewhere out there, out there. Yeah. We'll toss that into the uh, list of questions available and, to other, other authors. Right, and that comes up in Shipstar, that uh, there are other such societies, and they're cruising around too. They may not be built this way, but they're, they're there to exchange really long-term information about what's going on in the galaxy, about possible problems or newly emergent species that have to be dealt with, things like that. Greg and I have both been working with, uh, with uh, alien communications and aliens for a long time. Uh, Greg's got a, uh, a library uh, built, built up of aliens who can't travel but who can send uh, information. I've got the Draco Tavern. Uh, which is aliens gathering on Earth in slower than light ships. Pardon, what? The galaxy itself is a big, dumb object. Well, the uh, galaxy is a big, dumb object, yeah. Yeah, OK, I'll buy that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, bad things happen. Supernovae go off, destroy whole civilizations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, in a, in, a, in uh, hundreds of billions of years, we may find that big dumb object is an artifact. Uh, the galaxy has been reshaped. It'll probably still be sh stable because you don't want to shape it unstable. Um, so Mr. Niven, I, I grew up loving and devouring your books. 
um, and you've both been writing for quite a while. And over that time, technology has advanced a lot, but you're writing about things that are so far in the future that today's differences in technology don't make much difference. I'm curious how, how you feel your writing process is different now that there's so much advanced I've been technology using we one know rule. about. Uh, actually, I've been using a lot of rules. Here's one for free. Uh, you, you look at what, human, what humankind or any uh, intelligent being will want and need, and you try to guess what it'll look like. Uh, ultimates, there, there are ultimates. You want instant communication. Uh, you probably can't exceed light speed, but, but instant communication we've already got. Uh, we want instant learning. That's a tough one. It's got some drawbacks. That, can we, that we can play with. Uh, we've, we've always wanted to drive faster. Uh, the, the, uh, the better your vehicles, uh, the, the quicker you can uh, get to where you're going, the better. Uh, try to guess what the ultimates will be, and you've got a story. Yeah. That's the advance of technology. But what, for example, of the speeding up of evolution? And how do you speed up evolution if your, let's say, your cortex material grows up in complexity? Can you do that? Or you know, like, are there different paths of evolution in, you know, like in 10 million or billions of years in the future? Well, well remember, we got this astonishingly smart cerebral cortex for some kind of evolutionary reason. And many biologists are rather puzzled by why we're so good at things that don't seem to have any real application way back there in the plains of Africa. Uh, and it is kind of mysterious. I mean, it's hard to believe that, uh, that all of mathematics was, was opened up by the, our ability to essentially understand plane geometry and the trajectory of thrown spears. You know, it's a big leap from saying, well, you know, I want to hit this thing. And well, it was once upon a time, there was a primate that threw a rock after something he wanted to kill. And it saw it as a kind of a complicated process. Those genes aren't with us anymore. The primate that said, hey, that's a beautiful parabola. That, we got those genes. So we got some kind of selection. And that's what leads to the aesthetic sense of mathematics. You know, the, Dirac, who invented the electron-positron idea and all that, uh, great mathematical physicist, said that to be a convincing physical law, it must be capable of beautiful expression. It, and if it's beautiful, it will be true. And he was guided by that. I asked him if it really was important. And he said, yeah, of course. I mean, what other guy do we have? There are many choices, but choose the beautiful. That's deeply embedded in the genome. And it got that way by something that happened a long time ago, and it's still at work. I mean, the species is still getting really lots better at things. And it is kind of a puzzle why we're so good at this. Um, and yet, we can't communicate with the dolphins and the whales very well. So, I would go with machines. Uh, the, uh -huh. the next stages, st stages of evolution will be building machines to do our thinking for us uh, better. Uh, I, I can't see that our brains are going to get much better. Uh, there's, not, there's no room in there. No room in the skull, no room in, the, in a woman's womb. Uh, we, we, we can, I see no end to being able to build machines to do our thinking for us and help us with our own thinking. Uh, we may wind up uh, as a combination of uh, human and machine. We may wind up with just the machines. Uh, stories point in all directions. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The machine intelligence. But remember, you know, when they did the autopsy on Einstein and preserved his brain, by the way, they found that the brain had enormous corrugation in the cerebral cortex, m much more than most people. And that's related somehow to the complexity of the wiring diagram. And so that's the way we've been proceeding is but you, we're not getting bigger brains, but we're getting better somehow. The yeah. only way to really increase 
intelligence in a species is to, or, and speedily, is to do it artificially. But we're doing that all the time. There was a study of the children of the people in the New Mexico town of Los Alamos that found the, uh, first that indeed uh, about 50% of intelligence is, is heritable. I'm an identical twin, and the other part of the research that shows that is also from identical twins. Uh, the, uh, but, but the trick is to see that there's, so far there's this reversion to the mean. You know, you get two really smart parents, the, the, the average intelligence of their children will be closer to the lower intelligence parents than to the upper. There's a return to the mean, but and that emerges from the fact that it's a complex property. And you change some things, and for the most part, um, it'll help you, but there's, there's always this, this convergent toward the average because it's a complex system. Nonetheless, you can still get a lot of smart people in places like, say, Palo Alto or Mountain View. Flattering the local crowd. Uh, that's you guys <laughs> didn't happen here by accident. You were gathered. Yeah. Uh, you you can fight the odds uh, by by intelligent design. Right. Social selection. So you're going to mate together with foreseeable consequences, and that's how you get differences in society. Is the simple self-selection of courtship, for example. So you put a whole lot of smart people in a room. You're going to get some smart descendants. And so now you understand the secret purpose of Google. <laughs> That's right, it's all about just getting laid. <laughs> but one thing always bothered me a little bit, and it was, I think, in the ring world and other stories, these uh, reproductive lotteries that's, uh, in which you suggest that uh, the human race was breeding for luck. And that, oh, seemed, oh, and that yeah. seemed a, a Man. rather unscientific concept to me. So I was wondering how you, you justify mixing it with strongly scientific concepts. Uh, you had to be there. <laughs> that is, if you're my age, then, then during the golden age, you were reading stories about psychic powers. Yeah. Analog was full of stories about psychic powers, cause, uh, cause probably because uh, Campbell was a believer, Campbell the editor. Uh, I, I, I had been un inundated with stories of psychic powers. I wrote a few myself trying to, trying to use, the, uh, use, use the assumptions uh, for hard, hard fantasy stories. Yeah. Uh, Gil the arm, for instance, with his imaginary arm that's, uh, that's, that's uh, T TK and, uh, and uh, ESP but limited by his imagination. Uh, then, yeah. then I finally got to, the, to, the, to thinking that, that the ultimate psychic power would be pure author control. <laughs> Tila Brown is pure author control. <laughs> uh, I called it luck. Uh, to, to Louis Wu, of course, it is luck. But you know the difference. And as soon as I was able to expose that, that that was what was going on, I got her off stage fast. Yeah, right. Actually, there's maybe a new rule here. Uh, something like, uh, if you don't know how it works, it always looks like magic. As soon as you explain it, then it ceases to be. Yes. So I've blown the whole thing for you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Well, it kind of intersects Clark's law. You know, any it, it sufficiently advanced technology looks like magic. I did a reversal, a reversal of that, when, when I, by the way, when I was visiting Arthur in Sri Lanka. And it's, it, it says, um, any technology that does not appear magical is insufficiently advanced. <laughs> uh, actually, that could be the motto of Google, really. <laughs> So um, as science fiction authors who have been writing for a long time, you've seen some of the assumptions of your stories broken um, either by scientific discoveries or um, MIT physics students. So has that affected how you write? Things have changed in physics and other sciences. And so some of our stories may be obsolete now or mistaken. So has that changed the way we write? No, because we're actually not any better at predicting the future than most people. Uh, uh, but uh, after all, we took this chance deliberately. Yeah. When we decided to write science fiction rather than fantasy, when we decided to, to predict to 
predict a future. We, we knew we could be obsolete rapidly. Uh, the fastest absolute, the fastest, the fastest story of mine ever became obsolete was my first one, oh, where yeah. they they looked into mercury and found out it wasn't geosyn it wasn't geosynchronous. Uh, oh, well. It was spinning one and a half times as fast as its uh, year. Uh, so it was you who made the move mercury, right? Nearly the fastest was Lucifer's hammer, where. Uh, where you're looking at uh, a 1975 future in which uh, the Earth gets hit with a comet, and a big one. Uh, we knew that was going to be obsolete. We, we hoped we were writing a bestseller that would sell hundreds of millions of copies be before it became obsolete. <laughs> yeah, and, and before the comet hits. It's a, it, it is just, just amazing how well Lucifer's hammer is selling now, given it's 40 years in the past. Yes. It's a historical, it's a historical disaster novel. Yeah, right. So a lot of us here actually end up having to write those maintenance chapters. Um, any, any advice on you know, like those pieces that you skipped out on? Like how should we be, because we're kind of trying to take smart objects and make them look dumb to people so they can have the fun parts of it happen to them. How, how do we go about maintaining these? Like, have you thought of fun failure cases of like, oh, like, it's invisible to the people in the environment, but the designers probably had to deal with this whole other mess of stuff? What do we do? You know, stories are, are, are about people under stress. You know, people who don't have any problems don't get written about <laughs> because they're boring. Yeah. Uh, um, so you're, you're the clue to how to construct a narrative about some technological idea or new invention or change in society is to say, who does this hurt? Who's going to be worried by this or bothered or, or defeated by it? That person should be the center of your story. And then this person has to understand the problem and get through it. That gives you the plot arc. Uh, I learned that long ago from James Blish, as a matter of fact who said, look for the person who has the most at risk. And that'll take you right to the center of the story. And, and from my point of view, uh, your goal should always be write a sentence that makes it impossible to not read the next sentence. Put that sentence first. <laughs> <laughs> try, and try to make it work all the way through a paragraph. If you can get a, a, a reader to read a whole paragraph and still want to read the second paragraph, then you're, you're on your way. And the reader will, will give up the, the voyage to you, and, and then you're in charge. But you've got to hook them first, and the hook had better be sharp. Um, this matter of the protagonist being the one who gets hurt, uh, I learned it from Theodore Sturgeon, and I used it to write Flash Crowd. I had lists. Yeah. One, what do I expect to, to be the result of uh, teleportation being invented about now. And two, who gets hurt? Yeah. And, and it, was, it was all either Jerry, Bar Jerry Barry Jensen or his father who guessed wrong uh, and, and lost it all on the stock exchanges. Yeah. And that's a very good example of a prediction, because Larry wrote that about teleportation and invented technology. But what the era of cell phones has done is to allow people, say in China particularly, to create flash crowds, everybody agrees they're going to be there. They show up, they do a protest, they disperse, they're gone. Didn't take teleportation, it took cell phones. But the flash crowd is a known political uh, phenomena everywhere now. But it's particularly being used by revolutionary groups. It was a big role in the Arab Spring. And it was all there in a science fiction story all along. Cleverly disguised. Yes. The older I get, the more I tend to reflect on how the world has changed around me and how, well, how I feel about those changes. As people who imagine what technology will look like in the future, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how technology has evolved over uh, your career, what, whether you're disappointed, inspired, bored, um, and how humans interact with technology. Every so often I find myself saying, welcome to the future. Uh, every so often, it, it just hits me in the face. Yeah. Uh, things didn't used to be this way. 
Yeah. You know, the, the most qualitative thing I can speak on is that when I was growing up and having my gee whiz moments, it was about space travel and transport. And that was sort of the theme of science fiction in the first half of the 20th century. But in the second half, it's been about information more and more. Your, your industry. Uh, we've kind of reached the limit on how fast you can go in the atmosphere for a while anyway. Uh, but the, the flight of information is speed of light. Uh, and, and so it's hard to get the feel of a phase shift in technologies from analog to digital, for example, and from hardware to software. And so you always wonder what's going to be the next thing. And, and uh, I've, I've actually published a, let's see, it was a cover story in the magazine Reason in 1997 called The Biological Century, saying the biggest motivating stuff that's going to make the world look different in the 21st century is going to come from biology, not physics. And it's going to be biological engineering of kinds that are kind of hard to anticipate. I expect they will mostly center around human reproduction at first. I mean, what are the boundaries on designer children, for example? Um, I was at a conference just recently at Arizona State University about what the century is going to look like. And I said, you know, there's an argument about should you be able to select for blue eyes or blonde hair or something like that? Well, maybe. But what about the editing out of qualities? I mean, there's a bell curve in, in intelligence. And everybody talks about, let's make smarter people. Let's work on the, on, the, on the upper end of the bell curve. What about the lower end? Do you want to edit out the, the people who are born with very, very low intelligence? Because they, we, we know from research, they typically don't have particularly happy lives. Um, do you want to edit them out? You want to tinker with the bell curve on the other side? Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't have a, a belief about it, but it's going to come up because we're going to figure some things out. Making the dumb humans smarter might be easier than making the smarter, smart ones smarter. Yeah. Uh, we could, well, we could change the, uh, the vote in this country with, uh, within a generation uh, if every voter uh, would do his homework. I that, do not know what the result would be. Would be. I, uh, people who make this prediction are generally wrong. Yeah. Uh, Making people smarter is what good books do. Let me yes. just remind the audience. That mm -hmm. could be true. You know, as far as voters go, isn't it easier to persuade your enemies to not vote? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give them something else to do, like, uh, say, Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, that was, that was catty, because Railroad Martin's an old friend of ours, but still. <laughs> Let me get back to the book a little bit. Uh, so as, as I said earlier, this is the sequel to Bowl of Heaven. And it's, you know, like if you think that science fiction is looking for life on Mars or on Europa, you may be wrong, because this is science fiction. I mean, this is millions of years into the future and really uh, strange possibilities, so to speak. So going back to Shipstar, which I haven't read yet, can you tell me what are the few points that, are, that you're really proud of exploring in, in the sequel? Uh, they weren't my, uh, well, they were. Uh, the, the, uh, cold mines that, that came from the comets, you're going to find them living on the back side of the bowl. Uh, Greg put them there. I would, I have explored uh, helium-2 he, helium uh, flavored uh, aliens since a long time ago. Yeah. Greg came up exactly with the, uh, with the uh, plasma creatures living in the sun itself, Gui uh, yeah. guiding the, uh, guide guiding the uh, flare. I, I'm reluctant to, to keep expo exposing secrets to you, but in, in fact, I think you'll enjoy the book, even if you see something coming. Yeah, one hopes. Uh, I mean, part of the whole strategy was to say, here's this object, right? You can see all this, you can see it, but lots of it is not explained 
and, and so we just let it sit there. I mean, in the, in the slides showing you the whole configuration, there are all kinds of puzzles there. But most people would look at it and sort of accept it, right? But we, our, our job was to try to figure out how it worked. Post facto, as a matter of fact, I, I mean, I, we didn't have these ideas when we started out. We just invented them as ways to make it plausible. Like, hey, half the air, surface area of the bowl is on the outside. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? Well, with that, I would like to thank our guests today, Larry Neven and Gregory Benford. Please give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you.